the tournament that we played in, all the games were played in the Boston Garden. The last night when we won the championship of what was called the Tech Tournament, what I remember, first of all, is winning in front of a sellout crowd. There were 13,909 people. Wow. I remember the crowd storming the floor, us cutting down the nets. And then after the game, there was a tradition that had been established years before. Uh, and that was if you won the championship, you got to ride on top of the fire engines. Wow. Through the city of Cambridge. We took the championship ride on the top of fire engines all through Cambridge. So we went through our neighborhood and all through the city at around midnight after winning the championship. Then you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So I'm getting curious if I'm thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, can you make the pass? Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles fired at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 82. Thanks for joining me. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome coaching luminary Mike Jarvis to the show. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did recording it. We cover Mike's career in basketball and life in general. He also shares some great stories from the numerous years he mentored and coached a young Patrick Ewing. Truly fascinating. Show notes for this episode, including links to numerous topics covered, are at inallairness.com slash 82. Now, on to the show. My guest today has a storied life in basketball. As a high school coach, he mentored Patrick Ewing and led his team to three consecutive state championships before embarking on 25 seasons as a Division One head coach leading three universities to the NCAA tournament and nine appearances in all. Mike Jarvis, thank you very much for joining me. It is my pleasure. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. We um, have been corresponding a bit in the last few days and I've learned a lot about your career and I'm I'm looking forward to expounding on that now. You attended, at the time it was called Ringe Technical High School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It is. It's Ringe and Latin High School. There used to be two high schools. I went to Ringe Tech as a a high schooler. My wife went to High and Latin. They merged the two high schools. So they put the two high schools together, and they kept basically both names, Ringe and Latin. So it became Cambridge, Ringe, and Latin High School. I've read that you were a a basketballer and a baseballer. Mm Mm-hmm. What led to your decision to, to focus on basketball? Well, actually, I played basketball, baseball, and football. On football as well. I broke my ankle as a freshman playing football, so I gave that sport up immediately <laughs> and <laughs> and concentrated on uh, basketball and baseball. I was a better baseball player. I was a catcher. Okay. Um, but I was not very good at hitting the curveball. So eventually that eliminated me from baseball, and I eventually concentrated more on basketball. Aha, uh-huh. okay, I've got it. And I also read that... Um in 1962, Cambridge was Class A Eastern Massachusetts champion. You had a 22-2 and two record. So what do you actually remember of that stellar season? Well, first of all, uh, the year before we had lost in the playoffs, in the tournament, in the Boston Garden. So we came back uh, as seniors. Uh, my teammates and I determined that we were going to be the best team in Massachusetts. And we were. We had the best player in Massachusetts, a young man by the name of Larry Stead. His nickname was Leader. He was our team leader. He was our team's highest scorer and rebounder. And he was my buddy, my lifelong friend from my neighborhood. Ah, fantastic. When you were a senior then and you got to have that great season, um, what are a couple of memories that you may have from that time? And especially playing in Boston Garden, which I believe you did play in the garden numerous times throughout your high school career as well? Yes, we did. In fact, the tournament that we played in, all the games were played in the Boston Garden. And the last night when we won the championship of what was called the Tech Tournament, 
What I remember, first of all, is is winning in front of a sellout crowd. There were 13,909 people. Wow. I remember the crowd storming the floor, us cutting down the nets. And then after the game, uh, there was a tradition that had been established years before. Uh, and that was if you won the tech tourney, if you won the championship, you got to ride on top of the fire engines. Wow. Through the city of Cambridge. We took the championship ride on the top of fire engines all through Cambridge. So we went through our neighborhood and all through the city at around midnight uh, after winning the championship. Oh, that's fantastic. Do you have any photos that were taken of that particular time? Oh, no, I wish we did. I, you know, back then, um, the photos that we might have been able to take back then were the Polaroid instant photos. But for whatever reason, there were never any photos that I ever saw of our championship ride on the fire engines. Sounds like a fantastic memory, though, and what an experience as well after having played in the Boston Garden and, and then winning that tournament too. So uh, great memories indeed. After your high school career, you attended Northeastern University and your coach there was a guy by the name of Dick Dukeshire? Correct. Dick Dukeshire, yeah. That was in the mid-1960s and the school records indicated that your team improved markedly from your sophomore through senior seasons and you went from 13 to 18 and then 22 wins respectively. Um, when you look back on your college experience uh, where academically you completed a bachelor's degree in physical education, what are some of the things that spring to mind most when you think about Northeastern, Mike? Well, what I think about is I had a great coach, a great teacher. Uh, Dick Dukeshire actually was the person that uh, really developed international basketball in Greece. He was like the architect of basketball for Greece when he left Northeastern. So he was a great teacher, a uh, very fundamental uh, coach, taught us how to play. I had never really been taught the fundamentals of the game. We won in high school just because of our talent. So I learned that there was much more than just how fast you could run or how high you could jump. Uh, it was really about the techniques and the fundamentals of basketball. So I learned the fundamentals from him. I also want to mention that I was very frustrated uh, as a sophomore, and I quit the basketball team as a sophomore. All right. And, yeah, I was living at home, and my brother uh, and father had a fish and chip store. Uh, so I went back and cooked in the fish and chip store. My brother uh, talked me into going back and apologizing and asking the coach for a second chance. So I did that. Um, he let me try out again the next year. I made the team. I still didn't play a lot, but that's when I decided that I wanted to be a coach. So I tried to learn as much as I could from him. And eventually he hired me as an assistant coach. So there's a chance that perhaps had you not been coerced by your brother to head back and make that apology that you might not have even continued to, to finish your time at Northeast and let alone go on to have that career and life in basketball that you've had to date. There's no doubt about it. I owe so much to my brother. He knew how much I loved to play and he knew how important it was to me. And that, you know, when I finally realized that I wasn't as good as I thought I was uh, and wanted to be a coach, he knew I had to go back. Plus, he knew uh, what a good coach I had in, in Coach Dukeshire. Um, now, if my timeline's correct, and as you did mention, you then went on to be an assistant coach at Northeastern through the 1973 season. Uh, towards the end of that tenure, you also were associated with the legendary Jim Calhoun, who was then head coach. All the while, you were a high school physical education teacher as well. Yes. How did you adjust to becoming uh, a coach? And also, you're a newly minted teacher and all these obligations are all at the same time. Well, I don't know. Somehow, um, the good Lord, uh, you know, just gave me the strength. My high school sweetheart and I, we got married in my senior year in college. And really, I mean, she was the one that uh, was able to make my dreams come true. And she supported me. And she worked when I was in school as a senior. And I mean, I wouldn't have ever been able to even try to do it half of the things that I did if it wasn't for my wife, Connie. Oh, fantastic. Um, most listeners would know that Jim Calhoun would then go on to enjoy uh, tremendous success at the University of Connecticut for well over 25 years. Correct. 
So that's a, a really interesting start to your coaching career in amongst doing that work with teaching as well. Um, now, following your time with Northeastern, you joined Harvard University's coaching staff, and at the time, they were led by eight-time NBA champion of the Boston Celtics, Tom Satch Sanders. That's correct. Can you describe the impact that these future uh, Basketball Hall of Famers in Calhoun and Sanders would actually have on your own coaching ideals, Mike? Well, first of all, I owe Jim Calhoun a lot of credit for keeping me on his staff uh, when he took over the job at Northeastern. Um, So he made it possible for me to continue to coach. Uh, When I went to Harvard, it was an opportunity to be able to coach uh, at a college that was within a 10-minute walk from my high school. So I would teach at the high school in the morning, and then I would walk through the Harvard yard over to the gym where I would coach with Satch. And I mean, he was such a great person. And obviously he had learned uh, from my childhood hero, Red Auerbach. And in fact, Red Auerbach used to come to a lot of our practices. So I got to really get to know him. And the great thing about Satch, he was such a quiet person that he needed somebody like me to do the yelling. So I was the (laughs) designated yeller. And, uh, I worked with him uh, while I coached the freshman team. So I coached the freshman team like around three, and then uh, I would assist him with the varsity team around 5.30. So I had actually my job in the morning teaching, and then I coached uh, two teams at Harvard, uh, the freshman, and I assisted him with the varsity. Okay, so you're a very busy man, to say the least. Oh, <laughs> yes, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned Red Hour back there and, and how he was an idol of yours uh, as you were growing up. Um, how present was he in your basketball circles throughout the 1970s? Well, he basically became a friend. Mm-hmm. Later, he would become one of my mentors. See, I grew up, my brother, Richard, uh, used to take me to the Celtics games. He would save up enough money to buy two tickets, one for him and one for me. And in fact, the first game I ever saw with my brother in the Boston Garden was Bill Russell's first game in the NBA. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I I was a Celtics fan during all of those championship years. I, I want to say they won like 11 out of 12 championships. Uh, and the only year they lost, was when Bill Russell sprained his ankle against the St. Louis Hawks. So when I used to go to the games and watch the Celtics, I think I spent a lot of my time watching Red Auerbach coach. And that's why I say he was definitely my coaching hero throughout my life. That's absolutely fascinating. So if I have my uh, timeline correct as well, just with what I remember, uh, Bill Russell, he started his rookie season late because he was actually over here in Australia at the 1956 Olympics. That's right. Yeah. I was in the sixth grade um, when my brother took me to my first professional game. I think that was Bill Russell's first game in the Boston Garden. They played against the Philadelphia Warriors. Uh, I think the Philadelphia Warriors at that time, it was before Wilt Chamberlain. They had a center by the name of Neil Johnson. If you look it up, I think Bill Russell had somewhere around 40 rebounds that first night. (laughs) (laughs) I will try to check that out as we uh, continue our conversation. Okay. That's just uh, some fantastic and really intriguing uh, background there as to what led to your rise in coaching. And of course, some very strong backgrounds there with guys, including Red Auerbach and uh, Dick Dukesire and of course, uh, Jim Calhoun and and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Before we actually chat about your amazing success at Cambridge High School, um, how did that actual head coaching position at your alma mater present itself? Because I believe there were some interesting circumstances behind that coming to be. (laughs) There were, you know, as you had mentioned before, I was I started out teaching. Mm-hmm. I was also an assistant coach at Northeastern for five years and Harvard for four years. So nine years uh, had passed. Um, I had given up all hope of being the, the head coach at the high school, which is the job I first wanted when I came out of college. And I was um, scheduled to become the head coach at Harvard. Um, when Satch left to become the assistant with the Celtics. So I thought I was going to get the Harvard job. I didn't get the Harvard job. Uh, what I got was I got booted out the door, so I was out of coaching. 
the 1971-72 season, I believe, I was out of coaching altogether. Later that next year, the high school job was open. They had a policy uh, back then where every year the high school job was a renewable job and the high school team did not live up to what the city's expectations were. They had a very good year, um, but they didn't win the championship. So uh, some of the members of the community got a petition uh, wanting me to be named coach. I eventually was named the coach um, by a four to three vote um, from the school committee. So I became the coach. I think it was 1977, I believe. Well, what an incredible turn of events for that to actually come to be and such a close four to three vote as well. Yeah. And that again hinged on your possible continuing your coaching career. That's right. When you think about it, so many different machinations of what could have been, but. Oh, yeah. That then led to, I think it was seven seasons that you spent coaching them? Yes, seven seasons at the high school. An incredible record at one stage, uh, we'll get to in just a moment, which was 77-1. and one. Mm-hmm. There's a, a Jamaican-born figure <laughs> who looms large in Cambridge's uh, extraordinary success, and that's, of course, Patrick Ewing. Before we even just get to your association with Patrick, um, what sort of strategies were you looking to implement and how did you intend to get the team to go forward and, and have the success that obviously the city almost demanded? They did demand it. <laughs> the year before I came, they had already lost two games. And I think they lost those two games by a total of maybe three points. So they almost had an undefeated season, but it wasn't good enough. And there were some people that thought that I was, you know, the best person for the job. Um, so anyhow, um, fortunately for me, four years prior to that, I had my first encounter with Patrick Ewing mm. when he first came from Jamaica as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old. His phys ed teacher was a football coach, didn't know a lot about basketball. So he asked me to work with Patrick and try to teach him the fundamentals of the game, which I did. I didn't know that four years later I would be coaching him in high school, but that's how God works. So when I took the team over, Patrick was going into his sophomore year uh, he was still very thin, but he had grown to be about 6'9", six, 6'10". Six, you know, you could see that he was going to be pretty daggone good. <laughs> and every year he got better and better and better. And the thing about Patrick, he he was always the first person to practice, the last person to leave. He was an incredibly smart player. He knew what everyone was supposed to do on the floor. And he didn't care about scoring. He All he wanted to do was win first. The player that I wanted to model him after was Bill Russell. It was amazing that the guy that I grew up idolizing, I ended up getting a player that would become the best player in America and the most dominant center in America in Patrick Ewing. It truly is fantastic. As I was researching, I was enjoying it so much. As you mentioned, Patrick moved from Jamaica to the Boston area in mid-1970s. Mm -hmm. His mother had actually arrived in Massachusetts a few years earlier, from what I understand, uh, and then Patrick came across. Yes. How did you handle the process of developing trust with Patrick and, and his family? What was that process like? Well, Patrick trusted me because his mother trusted me. Uh, Patrick's mother was from Jamaica, from the West Indies. My wife, um, her mother was born in the West Indies, in Barbados. Oh. So when Mrs. Ewing came to Cambridge, she got to be friendly with my wife's mother. And my wife uh, also got to be friendly with Mrs. Ewing, and they would talk about some of the different food dishes, particularly the rice dishes that they would make and the, you know, the curry chicken and all that. So there was a bond between the women. And Mrs. Ewing trusted me uh, so much that she basically put all of the basketball and uh, fears in my hands. And she basically told me to handle everything. So Fortunately for me, I had coached at the collegiate level. I had also uh, learned a lot from how Lou Alcindor, before he became Kareem Jewel jabbar when he was in high school, you know, about his recruitment. So we were able to put together a, a very unique, uh, one-of-a-kind uh, model of how the best player in America should be recruited. And so the recruitment was very, very orderly. Um, you know, every school just about in America wanted to recruit Patrick. Mm. We narrowed down the choices eventually to schools that would fit his needs. 
And I think there were 16 schools that came in for visits. And then we selected six schools that he would visit. And then ultimately and eventually he picked Georgetown. I was just fascinated when I read that about the process that was involved. Uh, that was with uh, Ewing's junior high school coach, Steve Jenkins, and yourself. Is that correct? Yes. He was his phys ed teacher, the guy who brought him to the gym when he first came. Oh, okay, that's the same gentleman. Wow. The same gentleman who was a very good friend of his. We had a committee. Two of my assistants, Al Cocoludo, who would eventually become the coach at Ringe after I left, and Vin Milley, uh were part of the uh, committee along with Steve. So we had a, a group of five people that basically would interview um, the coaches when they came to visit. Right, okay. And according to a, uh, a Jackie McMullen Boston Globe article that I read, the actual news conference to announce Patrick's choice of Georgetown took place at Satch Sanders' restaurant. That is correct, yes. Satch obviously was, you know, was a good friend. He had just opened up a restaurant in Boston, and we decided that that would be a great place to hold the press conference. Incredible. Um, do you remember much about the actual day itself when Patrick did front the media? Obviously, he was a, a shy and somewhat reserved person in front of the cameras, but you know him away from the cameras and the limelight, how he might have been, and uh, he seemed to be such a, an endearing character. Yes. Do you mind just sort of talking about that particular day where he had to front the media and announce where he was heading to, and of course, that he didn't stay in the New England area, uh, it did have an impact on even those that were in attendance. Some of them actually walked away at the time when they heard his announcement. Yes, they did. Uh, the schools that um, he visited at the time, Dr. Tom Davis was coaching at Boston College. Rick Patino was coaching at Boston University. Uh, North Carolina was another school where Dean Smith was coaching. Uh, UCLA, where Larry Brown was coaching. Villanova where Roly Massimino was coaching. Those were the schools that Patrick narrowed his choices down to. I think everybody thought that he was going to go to Boston College. And when he announced that he was going to go to Georgetown and play for John Thompson, uh, that didn't sit too well, especially, you know, with Georgetown being in the Big East with Boston College. And yes, uh, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of Boston people left that day uh, very disappointed. In fact, a lot of people in Massachusetts, and you can't blame them, they were really, really upset with his choice. Yeah, really an intriguing period of time. And, and unfortunately, that seemed to have further repercussions for the remainder of his high school games, where there were certain signs that would go up uh, in the crowd as well, which were very distasteful to say the absolute least. And then again, even into some of his college games at Georgetown. What did you make of the racial divide or the tensions in Massachusetts around that period of time there, Mark? Boston was really divided. Bill Russell had lots of problems that people never, ever knew about when he came with the Celtics. And it was always a, a very difficult place uh, for blacks to, you know, live and to really advance, to be honest with you. Mm. The city of Boston itself um, was very divided. Fortunately, we were in Cambridge, which is across the river. And not really part of Boston. We're our own city. But Boston at that time was going through forced busing where kids were being bused uh, because of the, you know, just the racial climate. They were being bused from one part of the city to another. That was not taking place in Cambridge. Boston could be a rough place. And, um, you know, like I said, when, when Patrick decided that he wasn't going to go to Boston College, then he became public enemy number one. Mm -hmm. Terrible, some of the things that actually happened around that period of time. Yeah, you know, like you said, there were nights when we had bricks thrown through our bus windows, our tires slashed at the games. There was one night, I remember, where some of the opposing fans dressed up in gorilla outfits and threw banana peelings on the floor. Oh, wow. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, it was. But, you know, I think what it did for us and for Patrick, we never, ever let our guard down. And we were ready all the time. I mean, it made us tougher, stronger, and certainly sharper. Well, that almost answered the next question that sprung to mind, and that was how did it affect 
your team in general, not just Patrick himself, of course, who had his own ways of dealing with things. And I think he did a, a really good job from all reports as far as blocking things out and, and just keeping to himself as best possible. But um, yeah, it certainly shed some light on some of the things that he had to endure and you had to endure uh, throughout your time there as well. Changing pace completely, um, Patrick would wear a T-shirt under his Hoyers jersey <laughs> when he played in college. <laughs> And I was aware of that, but I wasn't aware that that actual trend began as far back as his junior season in high school. As you mentioned, we lost one game in high school mm. and with Patrick, and that was in his junior year. We took our school bus and went to New Haven, Connecticut, where we met the state champions of Connecticut, Wilbur Cross High School. And it was a snowy winter night. And when we got to the game, Patrick had been feeling ill and he was running a fever. But yet, you know, you couldn't keep him out of the game. Throughout the game, probably about every five minutes, he would sweat through his uh, T-shirt and put on a new one. Um, He initially wore the first T-shirt because he was not feeling well and running a little bit of a fever. And so we brought uh, a bag full of T-shirts. And by the end of the night, I think he had gone through the whole bag of T-shirts. <laughs> uh, school colors were brown and gold. And we had all these gold T-shirts <laughs> that he totally, totally soaked completely through. And to be honest with you, because it was Massachusetts, uh, similar to uh, maybe Great Britain, the English weather was kind of cold and damp and snowy in the winter. Mm-hmm. And Patrick liked the feel of the t-shirt. So he kept wearing the t-shirt uh, even after that game. And when he went to college, he wore a t-shirt. And John Thompson, who was with Nike at the time, said, ha ha, we'll have the Nike swoosh on the t-shirt. <laughs> and that's when I really, I mean, that began really the t-shirt craze in America. Yeah, that's true. I, I really appreciate you opening up about uh, not only just that great little tidbit there, but of course the previous when we were chatting about some of the downtimes and off the court scenarios there. But it's it's great to sort of hear you talk about these things you've experienced. Sure, guys like Chris Mullen. I know Chris Mullen wore uh, a t shirt on and off throughout his career at St John's. Yes, he did. It certainly started a trend that, uh, and you'd have to say that Patrick was right up there with the one who, who first began that trend. Yes, he was. And I'm not saying he was the only one. I, of course, when I tell the story, I make it sound like, you know, nobody wore a T-shirt. But there were a few guys, especially in the Northeast, that wore T-shirts. It's a fascinating little tidbit there. In May of 1980, Patrick was invited to Team USA's Olympic trials in Kentucky. Correct. I've read that you were there with him, at least for part of that time. I was a uh, part of the staff, the coaching staff. I was selected to be a, um, an assistant at the trials. And to be honest with you, the main reason why I was selected was because I was Patrick's high school coach <laughs> and they wanted Patrick. So Patrick and I went together and, uh, you know, I assisted uh, Dave Gavitt, who was the head coach at that time. Can you recall watching uh, Patrick competing against guys who were probably at least two or three, maybe more years his senior? Oh, yeah. And obviously would go on to be future NBA stars. Like, How did he match up as a much younger guy who was still developing his uh, enormous potential? Well, at that time, they didn't have the pros playing. So he was playing against guys who were going into their junior and senior years in college. So they were basically four years uh, older than Patrick. Mm. You know, and also 50, 60 pounds heavier. Um, he did well, but he would, didn't dominate there. He was like another guy there. What he did learn was how much stronger and how much better he had to, to be because the older players, players like Bill Lambeer, um, they didn't care how young he was. They treated him as if he was a college player. There were a couple of times when he actually uh, got in a couple of fights <laughs> wow. with Lambeer and a few of the other guys because <laughs> he wouldn't back down from anybody. Well, that would have been interesting to see uh, if any footage of that exists. But, uh, yeah, they go on to, to battle for many years. Yes. How was the response from those in the city uh, to that incredible success of three straight state championships? And once Patrick had finished his high school days, how did you readjust the team because you were still with the squad through another three or four seasons beyond that. Yes, I was. The city, I mean, they couldn't be more proud of their team, a team that brought national recognition. They loved it, and so did I. 
and we developed a great basketball program with youngsters. We, we started, in fact, the year that I was out of coaching, I started a youth basketball program called Shoot Straight, a co-ed program. And what happened was my players used to actually coach the younger kids. So my players were uh, serving as leaders and mentors for the younger kids in Cambridge. So everybody wanted to play for the high school. And after Patrick left, we had one year, which we were sort of like just okay. We had a couple of years where we were decent. And then we became great again uh, because one of those players that was in our youth program developed into a first-team All-American at the high school, and that was Ramil Robinson, who went on to be um, first-team All-American and lottery draft pick uh, and national champion at Michigan. So I got a chance to help uh, develop and um, bring him along. Um, and he played for me. He started for me as a freshman, uh, played uh, two more seasons. And he was going into his last year of high school when I took the Boston University job. Him and my son were playing together at that time. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was probably the next greatest player after Patrick to play at the high school. Romeo's also Jamaican born as well, isn't he? That's right. He had moved to to Cambridge and you got to understand now Cambridge uh and the reason why why the Jamaican the West Indian folks moved to Cambridge was because we had a very large population from the West Indies so folks felt very comfortable they could get jobs come in and um you know acclimate to the culture and to Cambridge very easily and they had family usually and friends living in the city so Ramil I think came from Jamaica maybe when he was around seven or eight years of age. In April of 1981, it was after those three consecutive state championships, you coached in the McDonald's High School All-American game. Yes. Took place in Wichita, Kansas, and you led the East team, which was packed with some future NBA stars, uh, such as Michael Jordan, uh, Chris (laughs) Mullen, Bill Wennington, just to name a few. Yeah. Just to name a few. And the West team included uh, an upcoming guest of this show, Sam Vincent. Yes. Enos Watley and Greg Dryling. Um, Right. And a former guest, a great friend of the show, Nigel Miguel, was also part of the Western team. All great guys. Your East team held on to win 96 to 95. That was behind 30 points from Michael Jordan, who (laughs) also made two free throws with 11 seconds left to help secure the win. Yes. All that said, it's a long preamble, but there's next to no video footage that exists from that All-American game. Uh, Therefore, any memories that you're willing to to share would be obviously most appreciated. Yeah, well, that was was an experience of a lifetime. Um, I was selected to coach that team. I was also uh, given the responsibility of of selecting my assistant. I chose uh, my 12-year-old son to be my assistant coach. I was going to ask about that. I saw a team photo that actually says Mike Jarvis Jr., assistant coach. That's right. And he took his job seriously. And I'll tell you a story that was incredible. Uh, so we go out to Wichita. This was before Facebook and Twitter and all of this other stuff. So I didn't know who these players were. I had never heard of Michael Jordan before. Mm. Uh, I, I heard a little bit about Chris Mullins, but... You know, high school players didn't get the kind of publicity that they do now. So I get this team. And the other thing that's kind of important here is that Patrick Ewing had already played in his two All-Star games. You could only play in two postseason All-Star games. So he had played in the Dapper Dan uh, and in the Classic in D.C. So he couldn't play in the game. Mm. He did come out to Wichita to be honored as a member of the uh, McDonald's All-American team. uh, But he couldn't play. Uh, we went from what would have been a good-sized team to being an undersized team. In fact, um, even though we had uh, our guards, you know, Michael Jordan and Buzz Peterson and Adrian Branch, they were all about six, 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 seven. But we only had one uh, really big guy, and that was Bill Winnington. The West Squad had three or four guys that were around seven feet tall. So we were the smaller team, but I think that helped us because we became the quicker team. And Michael Jordan was incredible. In fact, uh, he made the last, uh, I want to say he's probably scored the last 12 points for us. <laughs> and uh, I knew if we had the ball last that we would win the game. And sure enough, the game was tied and Michael got fouled and he made the free throws. 
Um, but, you know, during that game, let me tell you a story that, um, and this was the night I knew that my 12-year-old son was going to be a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, the game had barely begun, and he was sitting next to me like uh, he did throughout our career together. And he nudged me in the side with his little elbow, and he says, hey, Dad, we got to get him out the game. And I said, who? He says, uh, Adrian Branch. He's not playing any defense. <laughs> and I looked out, and I said, you know what, Mike? You're right. So I took Adrian out the game, and Adrian was not happy. And he went storming down the end of the bench and sat himself down the chair. And my son, a couple of seconds later, got up out of his chair, and he went down, and he kneeled in front of Adrian, and he said, Adrian, if you don't play defense, my dad ain't going to put you back in. <laughs> so Adrian Branch almost fell out of his chair. I can imagine. Oh, Mike came back, <laughs> sat back down. About a minute or two minutes later, he hit me again with an elbow, and he says, hey, let's give Adrian another shot. Oh. I said, why not? So I put Adrian back in the game. Adrian played his butt off. He ended up actually winning the MVP, even though Michael should have, but he played a great game. We won that game because of the team effort and also because of my son uh, getting under the skin of Adrian Branch and getting him to play some defense. That is so good. I love that story. Thank you very much for sharing that. Do you mind just talking about the impact that your son, Mike Jr., would obviously have and, and the journey that you shared together through many years uh, in the coaching ranks? Of course, that might have been his entry to coaching, but it would go on to be uh, quite an, a stellar effort for him as well over many years. Well, you know, I'm looking at a picture of he and I uh, coaching one of our last games as we speak, and I was at Boston University. He was going into his... I want to say his sophomore year, and I took the head coaching job at George Washington. Mm -hmm. He wanted to come with me. I said, no, you're staying here at Boston. You'll get your degree here and you'll play here. So he stayed at BU. But when he graduated, um, he wanted to be a coach. I had an opening on my staff, and obviously I hired him. I knew how good he was and how good he would be. And in 1993, we became the first black uh, father-son coaching team, first African-American, whatever term you want to use, mm -hmm. father-son coaching team in Division I college basketball. In fact, that first year when we were together, we went to the Sweet 16 at George Washington, and we played against the Michigan Fab Five and almost beat them. Then he went with me to, to St. John's, and when I... Um, I uh, was out of coaching after St. John's, between St. John's and Florida Atlantic. Mike went and worked for a couple of years at Duke with Mike Krzyzewski. Uh When I went back to, into coaching at uh, Florida Atlantic, Mike said, Dad, I want to work with you again. And he came and worked with me again. So we've coached our first game together during the 92-93 uh, season at GW. And we coached our last game together uh, during the 2013 14 season at Florida Atlantic. Just fantastic memories, and it's really great to hear you speak, uh, obviously, so uh, lovingly of uh, of your son and his importance that he's had in, uh, of course, your time professionally and uh, obviously your way from the court too. Yes. Thanks for sharing that. Now, um, rounding out your time at Ringe High School, um, three times you were actually named Massachusetts High School Coach of the Year, which is an incredible achievement. Did those honours also coincide with the three state titles or were they spread out? They coincided uh, with the titles. And I, I really think in a way they did it the right way. Uh, whichever team won the championship, that coach would normally be named Coach of the Year. I always thought that, you know, the Coach of the Year should have won a championship. And it just so happened that that's the way they did it in Massachusetts back then. On the tail end of that, then you were offered the opportunity to become head coach at the college level, and this time it was a move to Boston University. Um, what were the circumstances that led to you heading to the college side of things, Mike? There were a few things. One, I, I really wanted a new challenge. Uh, that was number one, and it's not often, uh, especially back then, very few African Americans were head coaches in college. In fact, when I went to college, uh, I became one of 16, and eight of those coaches were at the predominantly black schools. 
So there were only eight coaches uh, in the whole country out of almost 300 that, you know, were African-American. So it was a great honor. Mm. And the other thing was is that when I went to coach at BU, both of my, my children, my son and my daughter, were advancing in high school, and I was able to negotiate with the president of the university a full scholarship for both of my kids. So when I look back now, I mean, it was probably from a financial standpoint, I know I would not have been able to send both of my kids to Boston University. Mike eventually um, got a basketball scholarship, but they both were admitted to BU on scholarships. That's fantastic. Was it at Boston University where you would obtain your master's in education? That year I was out of coach and I began the process. And the year before I actually went to coach at Boston University, I got my master's degree in education. That's another great achievement to add to the the collection. Um, now, we're talking 1985-86 was your first season with BU. And in five seasons, you led the team to the National Invitational Tournament in 86. You won two conference championships in 88 and 90 and then made two NCAA tournament appearances also in 88 and 90. And on top of that, you surpassed Rick Pitino to become BU's most winningest coach at that time as well. Again, the achievements continue to roll on. A fantastic first five seasons of coaching at that level. What are your thoughts on that first foray into head coaching at college? Well, you know, the the advantage that I had was that I had worked as an assistant for nine years under two really exceptional coaches. It wasn't like I was just becoming a college coach from being a high school coach. I had been a college coach already. I was prepared for it. Um, and what coaching in high school did for me was really just solidify the fact that I was a teacher first and that the game uh, and the things I learned um, from both Calhoun and Tom Sanders was to keep the game simple. And same thing that Red Auerbach did. So I was prepared when I went to college to be a head coach because of the experiences I had before. Plus, my high school team was not an ordinary high school team. I mean, we could have beat a lot of colleges back then. You know, I was well prepared. Moving on beyond Boston University... You were the head coach at George Washington University for eight seasons. That was 1991 through 1998. And you enjoyed some great success during that period. Uh, there was three NIT appearances in 91, 95, and 97. And four times you made the NCAA tourney, which was 93, as we talked about, 1994, 96, and 98. Now, you alluded to it a little while ago, but in 1993, you made it to the Sweet 16 before finally bowing out and it was only an eight-point game, 72-64, to uh, to Michigan's Fab Five. Right. Before I ask, actually, about a a 1994 trip to Australia. Yeah, there you go. Do you mind reflecting on that amazing turnaround with GW and taking the team so far into that 1993 tournament particularly? Once again, I had really good players um, who were totally committed to winning, you know, guys who had been through some tough times before I, I went there. And they were hungry. And I had a great coaching staff. And we were very fortunate. Uh, we were able to recruit a young man from Nigeria by the name of Yinka Dare, who actually ended up being drafted in the first round by the New Jersey Nets. Mm-hmm. And Yinka was such a strong player. And I had good guards. I had a young man by the name of Dirk Searles and a great point guard named Alvin Pearsall. I had good forwards, you know, uh, Vaughn Jones, uh, Sony Holland. I mean, I had really good players, uh, Nimbo Hammond. So we put it all together. We were one of the last teams selected for the tournament. Um, we got a really good draw. We, we were the 12 seed. We played against New Mexico. We beat them. We we're very fortunate that the higher seed, Georgia Tech, was upset. So we, we played a team that I, I think we would have beat nine out of 10 times, Southern University, uh, to go to the Sweet 16. And when we played against Michigan, our kids thought they could beat anybody. And Michigan jumped out to a big lead. Uh, we pressed them. And we had a good chance to beat them. Um, and that was the year that Chris Weber called the timeout against North Carolina. But what happened was, I want to say it was a two-point game. We might have even taken the lead. And on two or three different occasions, their players went to the free throw line and missed the free throw. But they got the rebound and put it back in. That's how they beat us in that game. 
by getting rebounds off of their own missed free throws and putting them back in. Otherwise, you know, it would have been maybe the greatest upset of all time in college basketball. Oh, most certainly. What, what was the uh, atmosphere like? I mean, the, the Fab Five were hyped beyond belief, and, and rightfully so. They had some fantastic players who a majority of, I think, four out of the five went on to be pros. Jalen Rose, Chris Webber, uh, Juwan Howard, uh, probably the three most recognizable, of course. Oh, yeah. What was that atmosphere like in the arena? The crowd, how was their reaction to your storming back and almost actually taking the victory? They couldn't believe it. I mean, neither could the announcers. Billy Packer, the famous uh, TV uh, basketball uh, announcer, uh, basically he questioned CBS for putting our game on. He said it was going to be a a massacre. Oh, wow. I didn't know about that. Yeah. I think we were down by about 17 points in the first half. And, you know, we went there to try and win. So I said, you know what, guys, we're going to press them. We didn't really zone press much that year, but we put on the zone press and I think we caught them off guard. They started to throw the ball away. Uh, we scored. And before you know it, there was a game going on. What I remember was there was 41, I think, 41,000 people in attendance in the Seattle Dome. And, you know, in the NCAA tournament, the fans always loved the underdog. All the fans got behind us. So we had the whole place cheering us on. I mean, other than the people that were there from Michigan, they were stunned. They didn't expect it. Even though we lost the game, uh, we felt like we won and we were treated like we won. We became heroes and put the school on the map. You more than held your own. It was only an eight-point game in the end. And uh, March Madness has made for teams like yours that were storming their way through. That's right. I can only imagine how great it would have been to have been part of that. Um, you did mention Yinka Dare, uh, probably the most recognizable player from that period of time at least he was to me because that's how I, I knew of his name was just through being a part of George Washington he averaged almost 14 points a game 10 rebounds and, and over two blocks of contest in two seasons with your Colonials and then was drafted number 14 overall in the first round of the uh, NBA draft in 94 he played for the New Jersey Nets as you were saying right passed away at age just 31 which was uh, really sad yes do you mind just elaborating a little bit more about your relationship with Yinka? Like, how, how was he off the court? Um, what did you sort of make of uh, the attention that came his way in the couple of seasons that he played with you? Well, you know, Yinka was one of the most gentle, kind people you ever want to meet. I mean, he spoke very, very softly. When he played, I mean, he played like um, Superman. But he was not a skilled player, but he was one of the strongest players that you would every time he dunked the ball the whole basket would shake he dominated games because other players were afraid of him Mm. but he didn't have the skill level to play at the next level if he'd stayed in college another year or two i think he would have but um but you know when when you have that kind of opportunity to make that kind of money it's something that you take now he played for one of my former players uh, at Boston University, Scott Spinelli was coaching at Milford Academy. In fact, the main reason why I was able to recruit Yinka was because he was playing with Scott, who I had coached. So obviously, I got a lot of help from Scott in the recruitment of uh, of Yinka. When he first came to the States to play in prep school, he couldn't play for more than two or three minutes before he'd have to come out the game because he was short of breath. And he thought he had a heart problem. So when he agreed to come to play for me, one of the first things I said that I would do was I would take him to meet with the cardiologist. We had an appointment with the with a heart specialist at Georgetown who examined Yinka and come to find out he didn't have a heart problem. He had asthma. Oh, okay. He went from being a kid that couldn't practice for more than three minutes, four minutes at a time to a kid who could now go through two hours, two and a half, three hours of practice just by basically using the inhaler. Now, later on, um, he had respiratory problems because I think he probably stopped regularly using his, um, you know, his inhaler, and that led to other things. But it was incredible that this kid, like I said, who couldn't play for more than two or three minutes at a time, um, became one of the most dominant players in college basketball. Yeah, that's some transformation. And uh, again, thanks for, for opening up and sharing those details with us as well. I'm much appreciated. Now, I did mention a little while ago, 
In May of 1994, you took your George Washington team to Australia yes. to play a series of exhibition games against some club teams, including uh, the Melbourne Tigers. Yes. My memory's a little hazy. However, I definitely went to one of the games. I think it was at what was then called Flinders Park in Melbourne. Um, I can't recall, though, if your game was part of a double header or not because you were touring as well with another team called Marathon Oil. Yes. Um, which was a, a combined team of U.S players right who were playing against our national team the australian boomers do you remember much about that trip to australia and, and what sort of impact it had on your team even though it was just a, an off-season jaunt for you guys well it was a trip of a lifetime i mean australia in fact my wife still talks about that trip <laughs> i think we started the trip in adelaide of course it took us we traveled for like 26 hours it's brutal <laughs> but it was worth it once we got there and it was an incredible trip. Uh, my wife and I can't wait till we go back to Australia. Uh, next time I go, though, I'm going to stay in Australia for at least two weeks and then go to New Zealand, I think. Ah, oh, yeah. It was a great trip. I don't know if we won any games. We may not have won a game. Competition was a little bit uh, keen. Yinka was not on that trip. He didn't play with us. When we first set the trip up, the intention was for him to be on the team, but he went to the NBA draft. We were really uh, shorthanded. We didn't have a, a real quality big guy. It wasn't until later that summer that we were able to get a young man um, who didn't go on that trip to play for us, uh, Alexander Cool from Belarus, who was another seven-footer, and he ended up playing for us that next season. He didn't go to Australia either. Your team continued to have great success post that trip to Australia and uh, through the 1998, as I was mentioning. And then you took on another challenge, a really big challenge, by moving to New York and taking over the helm of St. John's. That period of your career began in 1998, 99, and then you're with St. John's through 2003, 2004. Right. Again, you had some really good success at that period of time. Um, in your first season there, you made it all the way to the Elite Eight uh, in the NCAA tournament. You were the Big East champs in 2000 and then advanced to the round two of the tournament that same year. Um, now, however, 2003 came around and it certainly wasn't smooth sailing at that particular period of time. When you reflect on your years with St. John's, um, what sort of memories spring to mind there, Mike? Well, first of all, overall, I mean, we had incredibly great success. We were in the NCAA tournament three out of the five years. We won the NIT. We went to the Elite Eight. Um, and my best player actually had his worst game of his career in that game that we lost to Ohio State by three. We should have really went to the Final Four. We were without our center, who had been hurt. Mm. And Ron didn't play well. But we still had a chance to go to the Final Four. Um, and not too many coaches get to the Final Four. So I'll never forget that. Absolutely not. But um, it was an interesting time. I mean, St. John's, uh, an interesting school, you know, going through a transition. Um, you've got a lot of, you know, really hard-nosed kids who really compete. And what I remember most of all was that, I mean, we competed every night. And uh, we had a chance to win probably 99% of our games. We just sometimes got beat by better teams. But during that tenure, we beat um, Duke a couple of times, once in Madison Square Garden. And the other time, in fact, Duke, the only non-league loss that they've had in the last 18 years was to us in February of 2000. Wow. We went into Cameron Indoor, and we beat Duke. Um, and we beat Duke twice during my tenure. And uh, we won an NIT championship where we beat Bobby Knight. In fact, our teams beat Bobby Knight in the NCAA and the NIT. So I don't think there's too many other coaches that can say that their team's 2-0 and against uh, Bobby Knight. Very true. Yeah. You know, there was controversy, um, you know, uh, with the NCAA, Eric Barkley and some other college kids were being sort of hounded by the NCAA. And I think that had a lot to do with us losing. Uh, in the second round the following year because the year that we lost out in Arizona, we lost to Gonzaga, uh, who really was playing a home game. It was a year of a lot of controversy surrounding uh, not only Eric Barkley, but uh, a, a handful of players from around the country that the NCAA was sort of, you know, hounding and investigating. 
some tumultuous times, but overall, certainly you enjoyed some tremendous success there at St. John's. And how did it feel to actually walk off uh, Cameron Indoor Stadium and have the Cameron Crazies uh, quieted for once? What was that feeling like? Unlike anything else, number one, that is, I think, the best, the most incredible place to play in all of college basketball. And to go in there and do something that nobody else outside of the conference can do and to win, that's another thing. And then the other thing about that game that was so great, it was an early game. I want to say it was like a, it was either 12 o'clock or maybe two o'clock game. So we not only won the game, but we were able to enjoy the replays for the whole day, (laughs) you know, and that's what made it even more special. And we didn't have charter planes, so we had to wait till the next day to come home. So we were able to enjoy that victory for about 24 hours. It was great. That's fantastic. I love to hear that sort of stuff. How would the um, the pressures of the New York fans compare to back when you were coaching uh, in Massachusetts? Well, the New York fans were great. I mean, especially if you're winning. Yeah, they love their basketball too. Everybody gambles on the basketball games, and when you win, and everybody's making money. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. The fans were happy because we won most of our games. In New York, I mean, the fans are great. It's the newspapers, you know. I mean, now our president talks about fake news, and uh, we had a lot of fake news going on in, in sports uh, in New York. I mean, I think the hardest part about coaching in New York is dealing with the media. It's almost maybe as difficult as being president trying to deal with the media. That was the tough part, and it never really bothered me because I never thought I'd ever get fired, to be honest with you. I wasn't smart enough to realize that someday I, too, would be, would get the ax. But um, uh, it bothers your family and particularly um, your wife. And in my case, it really bothered my wife when some of the fans weren't quite happy with how, what we were doing. They haven't experienced anything like what we did since we left. You know, it really got to my wife, and uh, it's probably a blessing that I did leave there. If I had stayed, I don't know if my wife would still be alive today. I mean, you know, for her to be in the stands listening to people talk about her husband, that's one thing. But to be in the stands and have to listen to people talk about her husband and her son, that's a little bit too much for any woman to to handle. Oh, totally understandable there, and and, uh, you make some very valid points for sure. After leaving St. John's, you stepped away from coaching and began work as a basketball analyst. Uh, I believe you also wrote a book. You were working as a motivational speaker, and I'm sure there's plenty of other things that you did amongst that time before (laughs) returning to your your last coaching gig, which we'll get to shortly. But if you don't mind, and you have been very generous with your time, so I'm wary of that, but thank you so much. What was that transition like, leaving coaching after so long and then moving into work away from the, the sidelines? Well, it was tough. It was very, very difficult. It's something that most coaches who coached and taught as long as I did can never adjust to. Um, but um, with the help of the good Lord and my wife and my family, I was able to make the transition. Uh, we moved to Florida. Uh, we found a church home. Um, I was born again. I became a full-fledged Christian, joined a church, a small group. Um, And I did go to work um, in basketball uh, with ESPN and then eventually with Fox, be in sports. You know, it's really funny. I never, ever loved the TV work. I was working initially in the studio. If I knew then what I know now, I would have held out for a analyst job at the games because that's what I enjoyed. That was probably the next best thing to coaching because I could coach from behind a microphone behind a headset right so i enjoyed that i did not enjoy the studio Uh, but what i what i did and my wife helped me with this she said you know god has blessed you he's given you all these incredible experiences and you should share those so she encouraged me to write a book initially and then to speak and you know to share stories that were relatable, that people could use for their own benefit. Uh, And then that led to a second book. Um, The first book was Skills for Life, uh, which was a life skills book. Uh, The second book was Everybody Needs a Head Coach. And now I'm working on my third book, which is The Seven C's of Leadership. 
it's evolved into uh, basically giving me the ability to be able to not only speak about my life and about the basketball related stories, but also try to teach um, people how to be, including myself, how to be better leaders and mentors and make better parents. The, the speaking thing, I mean, I would do here and there. When you're working as a, you know, a basketball uh, analyst doing games, you have a game, one game, but it, it really takes three days out of the week, a day to travel, a day to do the game, and then another day to travel back home. Yep. So you don't have a whole lot of time. It's been over the last two years particularly that I have been able to really devote more time speaking, and I'm hoping to do even more of that. Uh, in the years to come if the good lot will keep me around for a while that sounds great and i'm sure you'll be around for plenty more years to come how did you find the process of writing those first two books was it something that came to you quite naturally or was there quite a bit of work behind the scenes to get the ideas together to then come onto the page how did that sort of work well you know what um one thing i've always been able to do is to work with really good people to recruit really good people so the first book skills for life I did that book with a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Peck, who has passed away, um, who helped me set up an advisory group with the young players at Boston University when I was coaching there. And that led to us writing a book about the things we were trying to teach them about the various life skills, you know, how to get along with people, how to communicate, how to look, how to act, all that kind of stuff, how to dress. That was the first book. The second book, I met a, a a young writer by the name of Chad Bonham years ago, and I contributed to a couple of books he was writing about legendary coach John Wooden. So I got to really like this guy. And my wife and I, after our time at uh, Flowered Atlantic was over in 2014, went on a cruise with uh, some Christian men and women. We followed the footsteps of the Apostle Paul through Greece onto Israel. And during that trip, I was encouraged by a lot of the older gentlemen to write a book. And my wife uh, said, yes, you should. So when I got home, I called Chad Bonham and I said, Chad, we're going to write a book together. And so he came to Florida. We sat by the ocean one day. I started to just tell him about all these different stories and different people like you and I have talked about, whether it be Michael Jordan or Red Auerbach or Sat Sanders or what have you, so the experiences that GW and St. John's and BU. So we went through maybe about 50 different stories. And that's when we decided that we would do a book called Everybody Needs a Head Coach. There were 23 chapters in the book. Every one is about uh, something that everybody needs. So we did that. The first two books sort of like gave me the, the impetus to try and maybe do a book on leadership and mentoring. And uh, that's why I'm doing the seven C's of leadership. And I'm also developing a, um, a, a leadership course that people will be able to take as, uh, as a college elective or even just as a, a enrichment course uh, on leadership using the seven C's of leadership as the book. You're a very busy man, Mike. <laughs> you must enjoy being on the go, which is uh, a good quality to have. Well, it's what keeps me going. I mean, to be very honest with you, my my mom lived to 98 and she was doing crossword puzzles until the day she died. I was always taught that uh, have a chance of living a long life, you have to stay busy and you have to keep the mind active. And that's what I'm trying to do. You should always do it doing something that you love. You know, I have a passion about the life that God has given me and I'm just trying to share it. Yeah, absolutely. Your last stop as head coach commenced in 2008. We have mentioned it a few times, Florida Atlantic, where you spent six seasons. In 2011, you were the regular season champions and made it to the National Invitational Tournament. How did you enjoy the return to coaching and uh, what was it like to get back in and, and be a leader of the, the young men again on and off the court? It was uh, it was challenging. I mean, it was probably the, the toughest job I ever had because Florida with very few exceptions, is not a basketball state. It's a football state. Uh, the school I coached at had no basketball history or tradition. In fact, the first league championship they ever won was the year that we won it. The resources really are not there for, for basketball. The facility is average at best. You know, so it was very, very difficult job. 
Um, we did get some good players. I think if I had scheduled differently, we would have won a lot more games. But I, I always believed in scheduling up, and I'd rather play and lose to a really good team than beat a bad team. Mm-hmm. We played a lot of teams that we probably shouldn't have been playing, uh, but we did that. We gave a lot of teams that were a lot more talented than us and had much more resources, some pretty good games. But if I had stayed there another couple of years, um, I think I would have won 100 games there. But that wasn't to be, and uh, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if I was still there. So I thank God for the opportunity to get in and to get out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like it was a trying scenario. And also making the NIT tournament to the first round, that's an impressive achievement, particularly given the background of the, the school at the time. Oh, yeah. Definitely have some positives to take away for sure. Um, you are a, a member of the Cambridge High School, Massachusetts Coaches, New England Coaches Association, and George Washington University Hall of Fames. Just looking back at your life as a coach and in basketball in general, what do they mean to you? Well, you know what they mean to me? They mean, number one, I've lived a long life. I've been blessed tremendously um, with really good players, with great players, with really, really good, great assistants. I have the most incredible wife and family in the world. Uh, just talking with you for the last hour, there used to be a show on television called This Is Your Life. Yeah, another one. That's what we just did. You went through basically my life. The only thing that we didn't talk about was when I was a little boy just starting into sports, but this conversation just makes me realize how blessed I am and how fortunate I am. Even though I know in my own mind I could coach tomorrow and be very, very good at it, uh, but that's not what the good Lord had in mind. He's got me right where he wants me to be, and he's got me doing what I'm doing. That's great to hear. I love to ask a question of my guests. Um, Basketball Digest had a regular feature which was called The Game I'll Never Forget. Right. We may have already chatted about it. Um, is there a particular game from your career across any of the levels that stands out the most? Oh, wow. A game I'll never forget. Hmm. You've probably coached in uh, tens of them. so. Uh... Yeah, I have. But, you know, we talked about the games that I'll never forget. First of all, as a player, I'll never forget the championship game in high school and riding the fire engines. I'll never forget the first time we won a state championship in high school. That was a season that everybody expected us to go undefeated, and we did. And I remember running into the locker room, screaming and yelling, and, oh, this is great. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me that it was an empty feeling. And the empty feeling came up over me because I realized that tomorrow, the next day, we were not going to be practicing. So it was almost like there was a big letdown. Um, you know, so I remember that. And obviously, I remember uh, that run uh, out to the Sweet 16. I remember our run to the Elite Eight, the Duke win at Cameron. I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I guess if I had to pick one game, I don't know what game it would be, to be very honest with you. It wasn't the Big East Championship, even though it could have been. I don't know. I would have to think about that. I, right now, I'm going to say those are the games. <laughs> okay. Totally understandable and acceptable. Uh, it's just something I like to throw out there and see what the answer comes back at. And uh, it speaks volumes, though, for all the things that you've done uh, with teams and players and individuals across such a, a, a diverse period of time and places as well. Um, I'd like to ask what jersey numbers players wore when they were playing in their career. As far as I can tell, you wore number 31 at Northeastern. Was there any significance to the jersey number 31? I think that was the only number they had left. <laughs> <laughs> in high school, I had number 21. Ah, okay. You know, once again, it was like, yeah, here's your uniform. You know, in those days, you didn't, players didn't pick their numbers. They just got a uniform if they were lucky. And it's just like when Patrick played in high school. He wore number 32. Why? I don't know. I guess that number was available. Also, it was the size that could fit. I, I think we got numbers according to the uniform that would fit us. Gotcha. Returning back to almost the start of our conversation, you mentioned Bill Russell playing a game against the Philadelphia Warriors. I've had a quick look on basketballreference.com, which is a great website. Yes. 
just after Christmas Day in 1956, he had a 15-point, 34-rebound game. 34. See, don't tell anybody it was only 34. I always tell people he got 40 <laughs> rebounds that night. <laughs> That's incredible. It is incredible. That was on the 26th of December of 1956. Day after Christmas. In fact, I'll remember now, you said 34. I'm going to have to remember that. I'm going to try to give the correct number. Instead of saying he had 40 <laughs> rebounds, I'll say he had 34. All right? 34 is still mighty impressive. Unbelievable. That draws a bow on a conversation which I couldn't have enjoyed any further. So thank you again, Mike, for taking the time to chat with me. And I look forward to sharing the conversation and send it out there for all to enjoy. Listen, when the day comes when you're ready to produce and direct the Mike Jarvis story, let me know. <laughs> We have a movie that we could make that I think, honestly, and I mean, there's some things, there's some stories that we didn't even have a chance to talk about that would make great movie. So you never know. Someday we might be doing a movie together, or at least or maybe you'll be in a theater watching my life on the big screen, you know? I'd love to, in either way, have some sort of involvement, whether it's helping out or at least watching the final product. Yeah. We've had to skip over some topics, <laughs> but I can't thank you enough for your time. I hope you uh, enjoyed reliving your career. I thank you. I look forward to seeing you again on my return to Australia, okay? By all means, please let me know. I'd definitely love to catch up and, and meet you in person. I will. Okay, well, thank you, and now we're friends for life, all right? Indeed. I love it. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. All right. God bless you. Take care, yourself. Thanks for listening. I welcome your interaction with the show. You can suggest topics or guests you want to hear conversations with. You can leave a voicemail. Simply visit inallairness.com slash voice. Click start recording. Leave a message and press stop. You can even listen back before submitting. Press send and you're done. Worldwide, the show currently has 73 reviews, 70 on iTunes and 3 on Stitcher. Thanks for your continued support. If you add a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are one of the best ways to support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please tell your basketball-loving friends about it. Your word-of-mouth recommendations are truly worth their weight in gold. Stay up to date with my podcast and subscribe to my monthly email newsletter. You'll receive exclusive details on upcoming podcast episodes, future high-profile guests to appear on the show, and much more. Simply visit inallairness.com slash news. You can subscribe to my show in various ways. Apple Podcasts, visit inallairness.com slash iTunes. Android, visit inallairness.com slash Android. Add it to your Stitcher playlist, inallairness.com slash Stitcher. And you can now subscribe to the show on Spotify, plus Pocket Casts, Player FM, TuneIn Radio, other podcatchers, and of course, via the Podcasts app on your iOS device of choice. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues, inallairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at InAllAnnis. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash InAllAnnis. Join me next time for another edition of the show.